This is the first lecture in our eighth series of Saturdays with the Saints. Friends, our series is dedicated to uplifting the lives of the saints in our university setting. In the middle of the third century, the celebrated theologian, Origen of Alexandria, wrote that in times when Jesus seems to be silent, his voice cries out in the lives of his genuine disciples. To change to a visual metaphor, the lives of the saints are like prisms in which the one mystery of the incarnate love of God is refracted into a rainbow of dazzling colors like those in the vision of Ezekiel the prophet. And while the saints come from the church and belong to the church, they don't belong to the church alone. For we know that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And it is for the love of the world that God so loved that the saints radiate in their lives the mystery of that one divine love. Really nothing could be so necessary in a world like ours, so much in need of the gracious healing power of divine love. To that ideal, we rededicate our series and we say, blessed be the Holy Trinity and blessed be God and his angels and his saints. Amen. Amen. Friends, the theme of our series this semester recalls the saying of Jesus that unless you become like little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Our lectures will be devoted to the theme of the childlike character of the saints and of the association of the saints with children and with all manner of things that a worldly overinvestment in power and prestige finds foolish. This leads me directly to the introduction of our first speaker, who will take up the topic of two saints who were not only childlike, but were actually children themselves. Anne Estelle, a Schoenstatt sister of Mary, is professor of theology right here at the University of Notre Dame. She joined the Faculty of Theology in 2007 after serving as professor of English at Purdue University, where she chaired the program in Medieval and Renaissance Studies. She's the recipient of a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship and of a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship. And she's the author of six books on topics ranging from the interpretation of the Song of Songs in the Middle Ages to the life of Joan of Arc and the theology of the Eucharist in, in the Middle Ages. She's also the editor of six book-length collections of essays including one especially relevant to our topic today called Lay Sanctity, Medieval and Modern, A Search for Models. And I should mention that a seventh volume is forthcoming on a collection of essays on that least understood gift of the Holy Spirit, the fear of the Lord. Judging from the popularity of her classes among students at all levels, however, fear is not among the reactions she inspires <laughs> on campus among her students. Rather, she has a reputation for inspiration and for faith-filled scholarly wisdom. The title of her talk today, The Child Saints of Fatima on the Occasion of Their Canonization. Please join me in warmly welcoming Sister Anne Estelle. When I hear an introduction like that, I'm always sure he's talking about someone else. <laughs> All right. On May 13th, 2017, the 100th anniversary of the first apparition of Our Lady of Fatima, Pope Francis canonized two of the three visionaries. Francisco Marto and his sister Jacinta. Francisco was nine years old and his little sister Jacinta seven at the time of the apparitions in 1917. Their cousin Lucia dos Santos was ten. Our Lady 
told them on June 13th of that year that she would soon take Francisco and Jacinta home to heaven. True to that word, during the great influenza epidemic of 1919, Francisco died on April 4th at age 11. Already ill at the time of her brother's death, Jacinta survived almost another year, returning her life to God on February 20th, 1920, at age 9. Apart from martyrs, Saints Francisco and Jacinta are the youngest saints to have been canonized. Their cousin Lucia died on February 13, 2005, at age 97, after spending most of her life in religious vows, first as a Dorothean sister, then as a Carmelite nun. Pope Francis opened her cause of canonization last spring on February 13th, the 12th anniversary of her death. The differences between and among the three visionaries are striking. Francisco could only see the beautiful lady. Jacinta could both see and hear her, but she did not converse with her. Lucia saw, heard, spoke and questioned and answered to the lady, and obediently recorded everything later in writing. Jacinta and Francisco are child saints, whereas a servant of God, Sister Lucia, has entered the process as an adult, through whose memoirs we know the details of what the children experienced in 1917 and what was privately revealed to them. Sister Lucia's memory of her own childhood and that of her young cousins has essentially shaped the church's memory of them. What do we remember? What do we call to mind about their childhood and through their holy childhood about our own? Although sometimes obscured by apocalyptic fears, cold world politics, conspiracy theories, new age weirdness, and strangely persistent criticism of a succession of popes, the essential message of Fatima has always been an urgent call to conversion and consecration, to the daily recitation of the rosary, to frequent communion, and to intercession for others through prayer and sacrifice. The child saints of Fatima help us to understand that call to sacrifice, penance, and prayer as a call to turn and become like little children. The medium, in short, is part of the message of Fatima and a means for its translation into terms that remain highly relevant to us today. Unless you turn and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 18, 12, 2. The evangelist reports that Jesus answered the question of his disciples, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, by placing a child in their midst as an object lesson to them in humility. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus points to the child as exemplary in humility and to childlikeness itself as a condition for entering the kingdom of heaven. In so doing, he also reveals something about himself. He points to himself as the greatest child, the son of the father, the way, the truth, and the life, whose humility is unsurpassed. He names himself meek and humble of heart, the slave and the servant of all. The child then exemplifies something truly great, indeed what is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But how? Children, as we know, can be naughty. Remembering his bad behavior in childhood and even in infancy, St. Augustine wonders, when or where was your servant ever innocent? As Stephanie Paussell remarks, theologians have typically answered this question by pointing to special qualities associated with childhood. Commenting on Matthew 18.2, unless you turn and become like children, Friedrich Schleiermacher hailed the ability of children to live in the present moment, their attitude of basic dependence, and the full range of their emotional life. Similarly, in 1962, the Jesuit theologian Karl Rahner wrote an essay entitled Ideas for a Theology of Childhood, in which he identified childhood 
with openness, even infinite openness, and characterized it as a state of trust, of openness, of expectation, of readiness to be controlled by another, of interior harmony with the unpredictable forces within which the individual finds himself confronted. Preaching a retreat to the Bethlehem Fathers in Switzerland in 1937, Father Joseph Kantenich also unfolded a whole theology of childhood, lifting up the Christian ideal of childlikeness as a daring, timely alternative to the Aryan ideal of the Nazi Ubermensch. He drew upon biblical, philosophical, psychological, and liturgical sources. And he encouraged his adult listeners to learn from the lives of child saints, such as Nellie of Holy God and St. Therese. In what follows, I want to see what we can learn about Our Lady's call to conversion at Fatima by considering the child saints, Francisco, Jacinta, and by extension, Lucia, not merely as the messengers of that call, but also as its first recipients and model respondents. More than their words, their lives make Fatima's message still today an imperative for us. Looking at Francisco and Jacinta through Lucia's eyes, we can see better what Jesus meant when he said, unless you turn and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. I limit myself to three interrelated topics, the children as players, the children as active dependents, and the children as secret keepers. In the children of Fatima, we catch a glimpse of Homo Ludens, the one who plays, even now in humanity's exile from paradise. Educator Maria Montessori has said that play is the work of the child, a serious activity, crucial to the child's intellectual, affective, and ethical development. Readers of Sister Lucia's memoirs and viewers of the Oscar-nominated 1952 Warner Brothers film, The Miracle of Our Lady of Fatima, are charmed by scenes of the children playing games together. In the movie, Jacinta and Lucia play jump rope, while a mischievous Francisco pauses in his flute playing, steals Jacinta's red apron, and uses it to play matador with a bighorn sheep. In Sister Lucia's memoirs, she mentions in particular how she and her cousins delighted to swing on tree branches, to sing popular songs, to dance, and to play games called pebbles, buttons, and forfeits. These games, in turn, are remembered as performances revelatory of each child's character. Francisco, we are told, was not much concerned about whether he won or lost in competitions a nonchalant attitude with which Lucia found fault. He played such games with his cousins, but he preferred to sit on a rock, dreamily absorbed in playing his flute. Jacinta, on the other hand, was a highly competitive player and could be oversensitive, pouting if she lost or did not get her way, and stubbornly refusing to hand over the buttons she had won off her cousin's shirts at the end of a game. When Jacinta won at Lucia's favorite game, forfeits, she typically commanded, excuse me, when Jacinta won, okay, at those games, she typically commanded the loser to catch a butterfly for her or to fetch a particular flower. Once, when Lucia won at forfeits, she commanded Jacinta to give Lucia's brother a kiss, a command that Jacinta resisted, negotiating instead for a substitute kiss of our Lord on a nearby crucifix. As playful children, the children of Fatima are perhaps most famous for the short form of the rosary they used before the apparitions. The two words, Hail Mary, on each bead of a decade to abbreviate the longer prayer. And, and also for the slow Hail Mary they sometimes prayed, shouting out each phrase from their stand on the hilltop and waiting to hear an echo back before going on to the next phrase. These childhood games were somewhat truncated and gradually underwent conversion 
after the apparitions began. First, the apparitions of the Angel of Peace in 1916, and then the six apparitions of Our Lady in 1917. The children started to pray the full rosary without abridgment. For example, adding the decade prayer taught them by Our Lady. O oh my Jesus, forgive us, preserve us from the fires of hell, take all souls to heaven, especially those most in need of thy mercy. As Lucia recalls, Jacinta, who loved to dance, decided at a certain point to give up dancing as a sacrifice offered for the salvation of souls, for the intentions of the Holy Father, and in reparation for sins. The publicity surrounding the apparitions and the influx of people to Algestral and Fatima gradually deprived the children of their customary places and times for playing games in blissful solitude. The children, however, remained children and did not cease to play, although their games became more serious and demanding. They became masters, for example, of a version of hide and seek in order to protect their secrets and to evade the ordeal of answering the wearisome questions of curious strangers about the apparitions. Jacinta reports that they climbed trees so that people wearing broad-brimmed hats would not see them as they walked below. <laughs> they hid in closets and sometimes took refuge in hillside caves in order to talk and to pray undisturbed. And they even, truthfully but misleadingly, directed people on the road who were looking for them to go to their family's home in town. <laughs> Often, however, they could not avoid either the relentless questioning of visitors, especially clergymen, or the flood of petitions people asked them to present to Our Lady. In such cases, they understood the rule of the game to be, be truthful, patient, and kind, and make of these difficult experiences repertory sacrifices offered for the souls of sinners and for the peace of a world at war. Increasingly, the child saints of Fatima became players in a divine game, what Chunsat's founder, Father Kentenich, later called a game of love. This game challenged them to find ways to fulfill the angel's request and the re repeated requests of Our Lady that they make sacrifices. Unknown to their parents, they gave away their lunches to poor children, eating wild berries and nuts instead. They renounced the offer of cool drinks on hot days. Jacinta offered up the pain of headaches, and they even wore a penitential rope that cha chafed their skin, a practice the Blessed Mother approved but modified, instructing them not to wear the rope at night. As Lucia recalls, the Angel of Peace had told them in 1916, make of everything you can a sacrifice and offer it to God as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended and in supplication for the conversion of sinners. You will thus draw down peace upon your country. Above all, accept and bear with submission the suffering our Lord will send you. Already at her first ap appearance, the beautiful lady who came to them in light at the COVID area asked them, are you willing to offer yourselves to God and to bear all the sufferings he wills to send you as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended and of supplication for the conversion of sinners? To this the children assented. They were e earnest to win souls, to win peace for the world, to ward off a terrible suffering, and they were inventive. They understood that the Mother of God had given them a valuable part to play in a drama that affected time and eternity, within which everything they freely offered, no matter how small, mattered. It made a difference. From the viewpoint of theological anthropology, Fatima's media, the children as Our Lady's engaged co-players, is part of its message. The spreading errors of communism of Russia, against which Our Lady of Fatima took her stand, 
These errors included a vastly different materialist conception of the human being as a replaceable part within the all-powerful collective. Late capitalism, we may add, mirrors this view, for it values the individual principally as a consumer whose desires are manipulated by the mass media. Fatima, by contrast, recognizes an inherent human dignity in the smallest of human agents, the child saints, who said their yes, and indeed everyone who chooses to make Our Lady's intentions his own, her own, and to cooperate with her in the cause of peace and reparation. The children as active dependents. The dependent status of children is a given. Their helplessness corresponds to the legal and moral duty of adults, chiefly their parents, but also the state, to care for them, providing for their physical and spiritual needs. This dependence is not merely passive, however, but entails the child's activity within a mutual relationship. In happy situations, small children surrender themselves to their parents' care, trusting in their love for them, and parents awaken strength in their children by freely making themselves dependent to some degree upon their children's help and cooperation, for example, with household chores. In tragic scenarios, the child's utter dependence renders them vulnerable to forms of abuse that awaken not loving self-surrender, but fear, resentment, even hatred. In positive situations, the parents act in a way that they communicate God's love for their children through their own love and direct their children's love in return not only to themselves, but to God. In negative situations, a parent's neglect or abuse constitute a, constitutes a serious obstacle to such a transference. The children of Fatima stand before us as active dependents whose trust in and cooperation with Our Lady affected their relationships not only with their parents, but also with the civil authorities of their day. The act of dependence of the children upon Our Lady gained its clearest expression on October 13, 1917. Lucia had asked for a sign that would enable the people's belief, and the Blessed Mother had promised that she would work such a sign in October, a promise that became publicly known and drew an estimated 70,000 people to the Cova da Iria. The influx of people who came in pouring rain to Fatima by foot, traveling great distances on muddy roads to the small village in the mountains, far from any large city, created an unstable situation. The parents of the children had reason to fear that a riot would break out, the children be killed by the mob, should their expectation of a miracle be disappointed. The children themselves showed no sign of doubt, however, and they made their way through the crowd to the Covada area before noon, the usual time of the ladies' appearance to them in light. The children kept their appointment, actively making themselves dependent on Our Lady, and their parents risked their lives with them. The now famous miracle of the sun occurred, prompting fear and awe, inciting people first to prayers of repentance and then to cries of praise. The widely circulating newspaper, O Secolo, featured an eyewitness report on the front page. The socialist administrator of the city of Orem had previously tried to quell the popular upsurge of religious faith and devotion by abducting the children to keep them from coming to the Kova on August 13th. He had hoped to disappoint the crowd assembled there and to force a confession from the children through imprisonment and the potent threat of torture and death. Interrogated separately, the children remained steadfast to their story. Reunited, they succeeded in moving the men in the jail to pray the rosary with them. <laughs> the frustrated administrator released them a few days later. That month, the lady came to them in Valhanos, 
a different grazing place to console them and assure them that she knew that they had done their part. The parents of Francisco and Jacinta believed the word of their children, who had never lied to them. Their trial of faith was to accept the illness and death of their two young children. Francisco died in their own home, a pious death marked by love for the hidden Jesus in the Eucharist and longing for heaven. While Jacinta died at a distance in the hospital at Lisbon, away from the parents she loved, depending on the promise of Our Lady to be with her. In Lucia's case, the disbelief and harassment of government officials was matched much more painfully by the opposition of her pious mother, Maria Rosa, who used every device at her disposal, cajolements, reproaches, tongue lashing, beatings with a broom handle, forced interviews with a local pastor to get her youngest daughter, Lucia, to declare that she had lied about seeing the lady thus putting her own soul in jeopardy and upsetting the fragile equilibrium of life at home and parish at a time of declared war and national unrest. In Lucia's own understanding, her refusal to say that she had lied when she hadn't was an act of fidelity, not only to the Blessed Mother, but also to her own mother, who had taught her always to be truthful who had previously shown her great affection and who had instructed her in the faith. In active dependency, she struggled to be an obedient, loving child, both to her parents and to God. By a special grace, Lucia writes, she bore the suffering of her mother's disbelief without bitterness as an offering to God. And she accepted the fact of this unbelief as a mysterious part of God's plan a negative witness, as it were, to the authenticity of the apparitions, since she and her natural family gained nothing earthly by them, and in fact suffered significant personal and economic loss due to the destruction of land and property. Maria Rosa herself wondered about her inability to believe, even after the miracle of the sun and her own remarkable healing, for which Lucia had prayed to Our Lady in the Cova. How strange, she said. Our Lady cured me, and somehow I still don't believe. I don't know how this can be. Lucia's father, Antonio dos Santos, who had quietly supported his daughter, died suddenly in July 1919, only three months after Francisco's passing. The children as secret keepers. There's no doubt, writes Max van Menen and his co-author Bas Levering, that secrecy is a distinctive feature of the experience of childhood. Not only is the child herself a secret to us adults with regard to her inner life, but also the significance of secrecy in the child's growth and educational development remains largely understudied and little understood. The child who has a secret place, a hiding place, a shoe box or drawer for hidden treasures, a diary with a key, a wrapped gift or a surprise, su planned surprise for mother or father, has begun to distinguish between her inner life and that which can be known about her by merely external means. This distinction enhances the child's personality in its layered depth even as it increases the possibility of intimacy in relationship with others. Both the special communion of a secret shared and the vulnerability experience through a secret betrayed. Pressed by curious adults to tell what she had experienced and, and seen when the statue of Our Lady of Victories at her bedside came to life, as it were, and smiled at her, <coughs> Little Therese Martin complied as best she could, but she suffered for years afterwards, as she writes in her story of a soul, under the impression that she had done wrong to speak of something so precious and personal, to let others intrude upon that life-changing moment of her childhood's intimacy with Mary, her heavenly mother. 
She sensed that she had lost an interior possession by speaking about it. Bernadette Subaru similarly desired to keep her vision of the inexpressibly beautiful lady at Lourdes a secret, even as she sensed it was too marvelous to keep only to herself. The secret she shared confidentially with her playmates soon became public knowledge through their babbling. The first short-lived secret of Fatima, if we may call it that, was simply this, that the beautiful lady had appeared to the children in the Kova on May 13th, requesting them to pray the rosary daily for peace, and listening, enlisting their willingness to suffer, and inviting them to expect her return on the 13th day of the next five months. At Lucia's urging, Francisco and Jacinta promised to say nothing about it, to keep it a secret. But that same evening, little Jacinta, unable to contain herself, blurted out the news about the beautiful lady from heaven to her parents, brothers, and sisters. Word quickly spread with difficult consequences for the three children and their families. Jacinta later felt great remorse for this, begged Lucia's and Francisco's forgiveness, and guarded herself against future slips of the tongue by keeping her eyes downcast when questioned about the secrets of the subsequent apparitions. There were certain things too wonderful or too terrible for them to say. The three children were especially tight-lipped about the momentous revelations of July 1917 when, as Sister Lucia later disclosed in writing, the children had a momentary vision of hell, heard Our Lady warn of the impending outbreak of a second world war worse than the first that would be announced by a strange light. And they witnessed a pictured scene, as it were, from an apocalyptic drama, at the climax of which a man in white, the Holy Father, is killed at the foot of a cross on a mountaintop. These secrets, usually described as the three secrets of Fatima, were faithfully guarded by the children. They certainly did disclose some things in 1917. For example, Our Lady's request that Lucia learn to read and write, Mary's promise to take the children to heaven, the repeated request for the daily praying of the rosary for peace, the assurance that a great sign would be given in October, the prediction that the war would soon end. When asked if Our Lady had told them or shown them anything more, however, the children would reply, yes, but it's a secret. <coughs> Lucia recalls in her memoirs that she agonized over the rightness of this honest reply since it inevitably provoked curiosity and speculation about matters about which the children did not want to speak. She sometimes wondered whether it wouldn't have been better just to try to say everything, but she and her cousins rightly balked at that. Sister Lucia's memoirs are unclear about whether Our Lady herself directly forbade them to speak of what they had seen or heard, or more likely, whether they themselves felt an inner demand in conscience not to reveal certain things. At the end of one awkward interview in 1918, the 11-year-old Lucia drew consolation from the word of a priest who told her, you're right, my child. The secret of the king's daughter should remain hidden in the depths of her heart. Another priest explicitly advised the children to protect the reserve of their inner experience. You can keep your secret, he told them, under the cover of Our Ladies. Writing in 1941, Lucia explains, whenever I was interrogated, I experienced an interior inspiration which directed me how to answer without either failing in truth or revealing what should remain hidden for the time being. In another memoir from that same year, she reflects, for me, keeping silence has been a great grace. What would have happened if I had described hell? 
Being unable to find words which exactly express the reality, I would therefore have said now one thing, now another, trying to explain, but not succeeding in doing so. What is certain is that the children felt responsible for what had been revealed to them and were motivated by it. As Father Andrew Apostoli has written, the apparitions affected the children in different ways. Jacinta, the youngest, intelligent, sensitive, was especially moved by the seriousness of sin, how it offends and separates us from God. The vision of hell affected her so much that she did not want anyone ever to go there. Moved by this desire, with incredible generosity for one so young, Jacinta offered herself completely for the salvation of souls, manifesting in word and deed a spirit of sacrifice that reached heroic proportions. Her attitude is best expressed in the Decad prayer taught to the children in July 1917, which concludes, lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need of thy mercy. Francisco, by contrast, took his bearings not so much from the vision of hell as from the beautiful sight of Our Lady and of her son, whom the children also beheld on October 13th, together with the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph. What I loved most of all, Francisco said, was to see our Lord in that light from Our Lady, which penetrated our hearts. A contemplative, Francisco wanted to console God by being present to him and by making reparation for sin. He seems to have been taken especially, to have taken especially to heart a call for Eucharistic adoration and the prayer taught the children by the angel of peace in the spring of 1916. My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. I beg pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love you. A servant of Our Lady, Lucia's attitude is best expressed in the question she asks at the start of every encounter with Our Lady. What do you want of me? Because of her mother's disbelief and hostility, and because of the early deaths of Francisco and Jacinta, Lucia, the eldest, left behind, suffered an interior distress and loneliness unknown to her cousins. Perhaps because of this, she became in a special way the bearer and promoter of devotion to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart, the purest of sanctuaries. It was to Lucia as a teenager, a postulant in the congregation of, of the Dorothean sisters, that Mary appeared in 1925 at Pontevedra, Spain, to request Lucia's promotion of the first five Saturdays devotion as a practical means to secure ongoing conversion for the sake of peace to pray the rosary, to confess one's sins, to receive Holy Communion devoutly as an expression of love for God and his mother. These, Lucia understood, are childlike contributions to Our Lady's work of peace. They're needed for the triumph of Mary's Immaculate Heart. To that Immaculate Heart, Pope Pius XII in 1942 and Pope St. John Paul II in 1984 have consecrated the world including Russia in a special way in their acts of consecration, as Our Lady of Fatima requested. As engaged and resourceful players in the great drama of salvation, as active dependents completely surrender to God and Our Lady, and as childlike guardians of the secrets, the mysteries of faith, the child saints of Fatima have much to teach us. If, as Pope Benedict has said, the mission of Our Lady of Fatima is far from over, then she must need us to turn and become like little children, to follow the examples of Jacinta, Francisco, and Lucia in prayer, sacrifice, conversion, and consecration. Saints Jacinta and Francisco pray for us. Our Lady of Fatima, Notre Dame, pray for us. Thank you.
And friends, we do have time for questions. Yes, Sister Ann, how could a 60, 70 year old become childlike? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I think you already have the secret, Father. <laughs> you know, um, and I think it, it, there's a certain lack of complicatedness about it, right? You know, you just you it, it's concrete, right? Um, you you do the little things of everyday life, and what really impressed me in preparing this talk was the importance of intention, right? You know, well, I think many of us are in the habit of making a morning offering where we kind of put everything in the bin, you know, at the beginning of the day and, and maybe at the end of the day have an examination of conscience and give it again. All right. But, you know, but that, but during the day, you know, if we could kind of more saturate it, you know, with, um, with uh, you know, that in, uh, the con conscious intention, you know, this, this is for you. You know, those little um, arrow prayers that you could say during the day. You know, this, this is for you. And this, this is, I'm, I'm doing this, you know, for peace. Uh, that would help a lot. And it takes, you know, little children, their world isn't very big. You know, they, they, there aren't, isn't so much they could do. <laughs> but there's not so much we can do either. And, and when you get older, you realize more and more how little you can do. <laughs> And so, you know, to make it very concrete, you know, just to think uh, and to try to think more often during the day about uh, in a, with a conscious intention to offer something. Yes. Can you provide a little more uh, detail about the miracle of the light that <coughs> uh, October 13th uh, it's a miracle? What what occurred? So it was raining, and, and then what happened? Yeah. Um, it had been raining heavily um, in the days leading up, all right? And this happened to coincide also with the, the, the important battle of the war um, the, in Flanders, okay? It was all going on at the same time. Um, and so, um, the, and the day of the apparition itself, um, it was still raining, okay? Um, and so the people had their umbrellas, as you could see in the picture. And then it kind of it lightened up a little bit around noon, so it was it was drizzling, you know, but it was still raining. And then all of a sudden, Lucia said, "Close your umbrellas." And all those seventy thousand people closed their umbrellas, right? Um, and it was still, you know, the rain was still coming down lightly. And then, and you know, there, and it was a lady was like a little late. She was like five minutes late. <laughs> You know, just just you know enough time for people to start getting restless. You know, and, and um, you know, but you know, so, so there was that little test of faith, right? You know, um, Our Lady showing herself. You know that she's, uh, you know, she's Our Lady, right? <laughs> and um, and then um, and then she did come. You know, the children saw her, and um, and then it, it's it's fascinating. It seems as if there were like two things happening at once. So. Um, the, Our Lady appeared, and then, um, as I understand, she um, she she pointed uh, to the sun, and a beam of light went from Our Lady to the sun. Right, that's what the children saw, and and then Jacinta said, excuse me, Lucia said that she felt just kind of an inner inspiration to to say, look at the sun, right, at that moment, right. And but meanwhile, the children are seeing they're 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 seeing Our Lady, right? And so for them, you know, what's happening with the sun, you know, isn't isn't the big thing, right? But but she said, look at the sun, and um, and it was because this beam of light from Our Lady was directed to the sun. And and then okay, and then the, the, so people looked up, and and for some, you know, we just had an eclipse, right? And so people are, are very conscious about how you don't really look directly at the sun, right? Uh, but on, on that particular day, people said they could look at the sun without any discomfort, um, and and then and as they directed their gaze up, the the sun started to dance and move in a in a uh, you know a, a strange way, and then it seemed to fall. Okay, so the, the sun was falling to the earth, and, and people started to cry out and, and, and take shelter um, and confess their sins out loud, and you know, it, was, it was all going on. You know, this, you know, this is just seconds. You know, this is all the happening. And, um, and then the, 
um, and then before it hit the Earth, <laughs> the the sun the, the sun went back. Right now, you know, of course, there um, some people skeptics would say, well, you know, you got seventy thousand people, and this was some kind of a, a mass uh, delirium. Right, but but people at a great distance who were not in the crowd also witnessed it. As as far as thirty miles away, you know, people saw this very unusual uh, phenomenon, and um, and then. Uh, and then, and then the the, uh, the the sun was back in the heaven. The skies cleared. The ground was dry. Their clothes was dry. Right, and there were some physical healings that took place you know, also during that moment. So that's what the crowd experienced. And meanwhile, the children, you know, they were seeing Our Lady. And then there were a series of visions that they saw. Um, uh, they saw, um, they saw the Holy Family. Uh, they saw Our Lord by himself, and they saw Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And, um, and so, you know, they're, they're children, so they're think, they're, you know, the, Our Lady talked to them you know, in pictures oftentimes, you know, and they weren't always sure themselves, you know, what the significance of it was. Um, and so some people who have studied Fatima have said, well, she revealed herself as Our Lady of the Rosary, right, on October 13th. She said, I'm the Our Lady of the Rosary. And that what she was showing them in pictures were really, you know, the mysteries of the rosary. So you had the, the joyful mysteries represented by the Holy Family, um, the sorrowful mysteries by our Lord, and, and the, uh, the glorious mysteries by Our Lady of Fatima, right? uh, not Fatima, of, of Carmel, okay? Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Um, so, so a lot was going on, right? And, um, and, the, and, then, and then when it was all over, when Our Lady departed, you know, she kind of would float away in a globe of light. <laughs> um, the the people, um, you know, broke out, you know, in just uh, exalt, you know, exaltation, you know, a miracle, a miracle, right? You know, and and they were celebrating Our Lady because she'd really done this, you know, as she promised, and they had all seen it. Um, and then the the people picked up the children and kind of carried them around. So that picture of um, that I showed of Lucia in the arms of that man. The children had come wearing flowers around their heads and. Um, Lucia wore her first communion dress. The other two had not received their first communion yet. Um, and so if everyone picked them up, you know, the nearby strong man picked them up and they were carrying them around among the crowds, but it was great jubilation, right? So, um, yeah. Yes, Peter. So, Sister, there's, there's been a lot of speculation that there's some connection between uh, the consecration of Russia to Mary's Immaculate Heart and the fall of communism mm -hmm. and um, that this and the shooting of John Paul and her saving of his life. What what is your impression of that speculation? Well, I mean it depends on which speculation it is. <laughs> I, I, there's there's some people who, who are still convinced that the Holy Father has not fulfilled our lady's request, right? Be because he didn't say out loud Russia, okay? Um, and instead, um, Pope, uh, Paul, uh, Pope Pius XII um, in included it in a kind of a covered way, you know, but he knew what he was saying, you know, in the phrase. And, and people look, who look at the consecration prayer can see, okay, here's where he's talking about Russia. And, um, and Pope John Paul d did it similarly but he also paused, so there were moments of silent prayer where, where he was including Russia con uh, uh, consciously. And the difference between the consecration of Pius XII and that of John Paul II was that John, Pope John Paul, St. Uh, John Paul actually consecrated the world to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart three times. Yeah, but, th but it was only the third time that he managed to get word out to the bishops in enough advanced time so that they could um, participate in it as a, as a college, you know, the College of Bishops. And, um, and so uh, Sister Lucia said afterwards that Our Lady accepted, you know, that, that he had really fulfilled the request of Our Lady of Fatima. Yeah, in 84. So as far as Sister Lucia was concerned, it's taken care of, all right? Okay, I, I, my personal opinion is that um, that people are not putting their attention where it should be placed, which is on our part, you know, in offering prayer and sacrifice, 
You know, you can easily get distracted thinking what the Pope hasn't done instead of examining yourself, <laughs> what haven't I done, you know, <laughs> to, you know, to bring about peace in the world. Yes. You said the three children experienced Mary in three different ways. Now after hearing, I know them much better. Can you remind us how they did it and the significance of that? Um, well, these, these children have very different personalities. And, and so it's, it's a lesson to us, right, you know, how you can be with, it, 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 that we know by life, right? You could be at a football game with your friend and have a very different experience of the game. Certain different things will stand out for you. All right. Out of this lecture, you're all going to walk out if you're remembering something different. Right? And so the experience of the children, each of them had a certain receptivity that went with their personality. And, and I think Our Lady was also teaching us something by, by, um, by the difference um, between and among the children. So the fact that, that Francisco could not hear what Our Lady said, right? So he, he could see her, but he couldn't hear her. You know, is already an indication that he's meant to be the contemplative in the group, right? The one who has that kind of spiritual vision, right? Who's just content just to look at our Lord and love him, right? Um, uh, in the case of Jacinta, she could hear and see, right? And so, so she um, could, uh, I mean, her mission, you know, was to, um, you know, she wanted to do something in response, right? So she became very active in offering sacrifice to save souls. Right. And, then, and then you have Lucia, who was told from the beginning, practically the beginning, you know, I w you're going to stay behind, and, and I want you to learn how to read and write. All right. So, so, she, so the, the, the use of language, communication, uh, was kind of her part um, from, from early on. Um, she had to study, and, um, and her sacrifice was to be lonely you know, um, for much of her life. And, so, friends, if there, oh, one more question. Last question. Understanding, in general, of the Mary's appearance at Fatima with her parents at Lourdes, and again at Chesterhova, the are there various parallels there, or the same basic, basic appeal. Well, each apparition is has its own character, um, but but in but, it, but you could all you could still all boil it down to the same thing. You know, Our Lady. Um, her mission is inseparable from that of our Lord's, right? And she's calling us to build the kingdom of heaven, right, in different ways. And so that's the important thing to remember. I think sometimes with a great anniversary year like this, Fatima, you know, um, you might think, well, should I, you know, should I join the Blue Army, right? You know, and it's not really not necessary that everyone joins a particular movement. But I think it is important that everybody have some kind of um, way of responding to Our Lady, you know, in whatever um, organization you belong to, whatever movement you belong to. And I think that in wherever the Holy Spirit is, you will find a presence of Mary um, that, um, and, and you can love her, you know, with the devotions and with the spirituality that you have. So, so friends, we couldn't possibly find a better note to finish on. So we have one remaining responsibility, and that's to thank our speaker once again. <laughs>